Um, but I think, as, as everyone else quite rightly is focusing on the specific um, issue of that cohort of women, I just wanted to look at what I think we should be looking at is the long-term implications for the state pension system of this issue. Because the question we need to be asking ourselves is, is it really fit for purpose? Do we have a state pension system that actually delivers any longer? And the key thing is this, we have a pay-as-you-go system. What is the most common argument we hear from ladies who have been affected by these changes? The most common argument you will hear is this. I paid in my contributions all my life. It is my pension pot. They believe they have paid in that money, so they have a contract of what they should receive in return. But the problem is this. There is no such pot. None of us in the state pension system have a pot with our name on it. We have a pay-as-you-go system. This month's national insurance contributions coming in from the working population pay this month's pension liabilities into the state system. And I'm afraid that system is extremely vulnerable in the face of demographic change. It's always a good way to honour lady. I'm very grateful to my former committee colleague for giving way. Um, but I would just like to ask, is it the same pay-as-the-go system for the DUP to remain in power? Um, that isn't a function of the state pension system, and uh, I, I will resist the, the, the bait she tries to get me to rise to. But uh, in my view, you know, it's important to remember the cost of all this. Uh, Department of Work and Pensions is £264 billion a year, of which the largest part is the state pension, £111 billion, by far the biggest single part of public expenditure. And that gives out a state pension on average around about just under £160 a week, not exactly a king's ransom. And, of course, pension of poverty would be far higher in the current age if it was not for the fact that we have a generation of pensioners, many of whom are fortunate enough to have occupational pensions, and good luck to them, my parents are in that generation, many of whom own property, and Savills estimate that the equity of people over 65 in housing is about £1.5 trillion. So I will in a, in a moment. So, so that, that generation have been cushioned to a certain degree, and of course by the actions of this government in protecting pensioner benefits, protecting the triple lock, bringing in the triple lock in the first place, all of which has, has actually protected <coughs> expenditure on the state pension from uh, necessary savings in other departments. I will give way to the Honourable Lady. I thank the Honourable Member for giving away, but would he not agree with me that, regardless of the figure he quoted, the people who are paying the price for this are women born in the 1950s? Actually, my point was going to be that everyone will end up paying the price. Of course, this debate is about a specific cohort that have been hit quite directly and over a specific period of time. There's the whole issue of notification. But young people going to workforce. They know about the retirement age changing. They have got notification. It doesn't mean they are going to be able to save adequately for their pension. It doesn't mean they are going to be able to afford one or to get a foot on the housing ladder, and they probably won't have an occupational pension. To me, we cannot look at this in isolation. We need to look at the whole system. I am going to take one more uh, intervention from the Would the honourable gentleman agree with me that we must get away from the language of talking about the women born in the 1950s as though they are some kind of burden yeah. on society? Yeah. Yeah. These women are only asking for what they were promised and what they themselves have paid for. They are not a burden. They are people looking for justice. No one is saying that. And my whole point is that it is precisely what the Honourable when they say they have paid in, it does not exist. It is just a mathematical fact. That is not a nefarious thing. The system was not designed for this ageing population that we have, the demographic change that we now have. And the duty on us in government and in this place is to be open and honest about that and try and come up with reforms that address it. And in my view, and it's, it's a it's a big deal. We should try and move to a funded pension system. And let's be honest, that's not a minor detail. If, if my old friend the minister went to his officials and said, what do they think of that? They'd say, sit down, put a cool flannel, wet flannel on your head, have a cup of tea and move on to the next issue. Because it is not a minor deal. As I understand it, the only government that has ever moved from a funded system to, uh, sorry, sorry, from a pay-as-you-go system to a funded one is Pinochet in Chile, uh, in Chile and he didn't have to worry about backbench rebellions and, and so on. Um, the, the, the thing is, it's extremely difficult because, of course, you have to pay twice. A generation have to pay twice. I believe it can be done. And one of the, uh, there are two, two uh, proposals we've had on this. In 90, uh, April 1997, our party in the general election proposed Basic Pension Plus. Peter Lilly came up with a system which was moving from the current state pension to a funded one. It, it, was, it would have been fully in place by 2040. So just 23 years from now, the liability of the state pension would have started to 
fall very dramatically. Instead, if you look at the OBR, the forecast 50 years from today for public spending at current prices is an extra £156 billion. Now, that's mainly due to demographic change and higher costs of health care, more complex health needs, and so on. But that is an extraordinary position to be in, and as they say, that is not remotely sustainable. Uh, the other option we've heard is from our friend, the uh, member for Western Super Mayor, the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Any funded state pension is effectively a sovereign wealth fund. <coughs> it is a way of taking all of the money we pay in, uh, into unproductive pay as you go state pension system and investing it to our country's productive needs boosting productivity, boosting investment, giving a greater return to people, giving greater ownership to people in, a, in an age when I think the, the ownership in the capitalist system is one of the things that's under threat. So there are huge uh, benefits to be had. At the moment, the savings ratio is extremely low. This would be one of the most worrying things in, in the Red Book at the budget we've just heard. The savings ratio is very low. But we do know that if you have a system which effectively forces people to save from a young age, it's very effective. That's what we've had with um, the new system that's come out. And so in my view, yes, there are specific issues to look at the ladies who've been affected by this change. But if we really want to resolve it, we have to take the long-term lessons and we owe it to those affected to say, how can we stop future generations being affected by it? Because if you own your pension, if, if it's yours, this sort of change that's arbitrarily impacted by the state, uh, it, put in place by the state, cannot happen. And it will take many years to put in place, but there would be immediate short-term benefit as we would move to an economy that was on a more long-term keel, that would create more confidence in investment, and in my view, we'd move away from a more boom-bust-centred, higher consumer debt model, which is why I think my honourable friends got it absolutely spot on with the Sovereign Wealth Fund. But either way, we need to start looking at it, we'll need a cross-party consensus, and we will need to be radical and look to the future and not just focus entirely on these short-term issues have to reduce the time limit to four minutes.